Hey, so this morning we are so honored to have our missionary, our friend, our co-laborer, our, our sister in Christ, Amy Rittering, here today. Let's give her a Hollywood Community Church welcome as she comes, Amy. Uh, and of course, I don't want to forget Moise. Moise is here with us today. Uh, welcome, Moise. How are you? Fine? Fine? Okay. So he's going to play with my phone while we're up here, all right? So for if you're new to HCC and you don't know, um, in our missions program, we partner with missionaries around the world. And uh, one of, if not our favorite missionary, is Amy Rittering. And so Amy has been in Burkina Faso now since 2011. And we support her. We support much of the ministry there. So Amy, can you kind of give an overview, maybe for someone that's new and for those who know of you, an overview as to, man, all the cool things that God is doing there in Burkina Faso? Okay, first, it's just really cool to be here. It's always great to be home, and especially when I'm able to share my heart as a witness to all that God is doing. Um, when we moved in 2011 to Burkina Faso, first we, beforehand, we didn't even know where Burkina Faso was, never had even heard of Burkina Faso. Um, we were going over there to uh, work with an orphanage, and uh, what we didn't realize, it was so much more than that. So uh, what we do have is we've got, we've got our orphanage with about 50 kids, uh, anywhere ages newborn all the way up to about 22 years old. Uh, we also have um, a medical clinic on site. We have a private Christian school that goes first grade through 10th grade, a uh, sponsorship program for children and for widows. Uh, we have a, a center where women in crisis can be trained uh, in skills. Uh, and we also have an agriculture program uh, where we are trying to find ways to extend the growing season so uh, people will have food all year long and not run out. Fantastic. And, and, and there's a lot more than that that's going on. So, so, but just so you know as a church, so a couple of things. So we not only support her as a missionary, but we fund, Hollywood Community Church completely funds the Women's Crisis Center. And we are so thrilled with what God is doing there. So, Amy, sometimes, I know you mentioned it, we kind of go with dreams, and God's dreams are bigger than ours. And I know this year has been one of those years where God has just kind of exploded every everything that's going on. So kind of update us with, with a couple of new things that are taking place in the ministry. Okay, yes, as uh, Pastor said, this has been an amazing year, a year where I feel so blessed to be on the front line seeing all that God is doing. Um, he's right. We have these dreams, and we dream big, but we can never outdream God. Amen. Um, so one of the things is this year with our school, we uh, built a new building, and we uh, are starting preschool. And so now uh, a preschool is a really cool thing because over there you can actually uh, have a total Christian curriculum. So this is going to be able to give kids a really solid foundation in Christ. Um, and it will also allow us the opportunity to minister to their families. Uh, we're super excited. You can see from the pictures uh, the beginning stages of building that foundation and then the school. And you can see on the bottom, that's the finished. Uh, that's actually not quite finished because there's some playground equipment now in front of that. Uh, and we're super excited to get those classes. And so, I mean, just so everybody knows, so the majority of the kids that come to this school don't come from Christian families. They don't come from Christian backgrounds, right? So this is an evangelistic tool. Is that correct? It, absolutely it is. Um, in the country, there is maybe about 15% uh, Christian and Catholic, and then the rest are Muslim and animist. So these families are all families where children wouldn't be going to school if it wasn't for their, the opportunity of coming to our school because we're a sponsorship school. And so uh, these kids, um, their parents want their kids to have an education. And we've seen so many lives change, not just the children themselves, but their families. And, and I'm not sure whether she has it today, but not only can you be involved in those kids' lives through your regular giving to HCC, but you actually can sponsor a child yourself, right? Yes. I, mean, I don't know whether you have opportunities to do that today. Um, yeah, I, I do have a few sponsorship packets, but I also can tell you that it's really easy now to go onto our website. You can actually select a child from the site um, and sign up right away and have like, you know, automatic withdrawals. But it really changes the life. These kids would not be going to school if it wasn't for sponsorship. 
Cool, cool. So, so what's going on? I know the, there's a new medical clinic, right? So tell yes. us about the medical clinic. So we, we always had a medical clinic, and the medical clinic was uh, to support the children in the orphanage, and then it grew also to support all the children in our sponsorship program and the widows in our sponsorship program. Uh, and we also started to do some village outreach to a couple villages that had no access to medical care. Uh, so what we've seen over the years is a really big gap in the services that are available in our community. Um, and so those services were a laboratory to be able to do testing on site, uh, an x-ray machine, and um, an ultrasound machine. And so we actually have been very blessed to get, begin, and we have our lab is already, phase one of our, our uh, expansion is done. And so we've just now opened up to the community to be able to offer affordable health care. And so now they can get their testing done. Uh, the importance of the x-ray, it takes about an hour and a half by car to get to the nearest uh, facility with an x-ray machine. I've had people that we've sent there and they've actually slept outside overnight because there was no technician there. Um, and then also 90% of the people don't have cars, so they, they're not going to a facility for x-rays. They're going to a local traditional healer. And we have seen so many people crippled, lose limbs, uh, have severe infections and even die because they haven't taken care of bones that have been broken. So, so, so the only x-ray machine in Yako is and within a 50 mile radius is at, ours, at yeah. your facility. Ours, How cool yeah. is that? Yeah. That's fantastic, yeah. Um, the ultrasound machine is also very important because one in 10 women die during childbirth. And if we can give good uh, prenatal and postnatal care, that is gonna be a tremendous um, benefit. We can bring those numbers down. And um, you know, with, that, with the fundraising that we're doing today uh, is going towards medical clinic. Uh, and in the future, you know, as I said, God's dreams are bigger, so I could even foresee in the future having a birthing center. Excellent. So all of you, when you came in today, you should have been given a coupon for wings and things. Did you get those? Can you hold those up in the air? Did you get those? For, so if you go eat at wings and things today um, and you present that coupon, 10% of your order will go back towards the medical clinic uh, there in Burkina Faso. So I don't know what your lunch or dinner plans are today, but let me encourage you to go to wings and things. Yeah. <laughs> okay, also... Um, we have started a brand new ministry. It's a street boy ministry. This is something that's been on my heart from the day one. I've seen these boys as young as five years old uh, in the streets. They're not well taken care of. Uh, they often don't have a, a place to sleep other than on the side of the road. They're malnourished. Uh, they're abused. They've got t terrible infections. Um, and these are kids that their parents actually have given them over to be cared for, but they're sent out to beg and bring back money every day. And so uh, we started about a year ago by just um, helping them to come to our clinic to get some medical care by giving them some peanuts and water when we see them. But now, um, so you'll see across the top, those pictures are the typical kind of boys that you'll see out on the street. And there's hundreds of them. Um, on the bottom, you'll see we have a brand new center now. And so once a week, and it'll grow from there, but once a week now, these boys are able to come to our center. They help out a little bit around the center, and then we give them soap, and we give them uh, detergent so they can take a shower, they can wash their clothes, uh, they're getting a hot meal, they're able to play and be kids. And you can tell from those bottom pictures, especially the one down there on the right, have you ever seen a child so happy to be able to wash their clothes? <laughs> so that's a really important ministry. Um, and then um, lastly, our, our Women's Crisis Center. This is, we are on our fourth group of women. This is such an important ministry. These women have been abandoned or abused uh, or their husbands have died and they're very young widows and they still have the ability to learn how to do something, but they never had the opportunity. They are not educated. And so that we have a nine month residential program where they come and they're able to learn skills to care for themselves and their families. Um, and we decided that we wanted to add a restaurant so that the women's could run it. And we wanted to have that restaurant very close to us and we were looking for the right property, but we couldn't find anything that we could purchase. Um, if, a, if the women are able to uh, have this restaurant, that's gonna help them learn how to run a small business. Uh, and we also want um, them to be able to find ways to make it more profitable by growing their own vegetables, by raising their own animals, by handling food safely. Um, and so 
when we were told that we couldn't build, really build something because we might have to move away, they said, oh yeah, put it there, but you might have to move away, it just came to me, food truck. And so we actually are gonna be having uh, probably a, a one of a kind because it's not normal there in Burkina to have a food truck. So I think it'll attract a lot of attention and bring people to us. Um, so yeah, that's the food truck down there on the bottom right. So we're in the process now of purchasing, changing the graphics. Right now it's forget about it meatballs, but it's going to... <laughs> We want our, our ladies also to think outside the box and start doing things that other people aren't doing. So our town is Yako. It's going to be Yako Taco. <laughs> so is there another Mexican restaurant in the Not whole country? Not even another. That's also probably um, selfish on my part because I love Mexican food. So I'm really excited. And we have all the ingredients there for them to be able to do these things and do them affordably. So I'm, I'm, they're all very excited, and I'm very excited too. Yako's Tacos supported by Hollywood Community Church. I love that. I love that. That's fantastic. Huh? Uh, I'm telling you, when I was there last year and our group was there, of all the things that are taking place, probably the thing that moved me more than anything else was the Women's Crisis Center. And to see these ladies who come in, who come from abusive homes, that have been abandoned by their families, and, and to see the change that takes place in their life. And Amy can tell you, they come in, they're, they're dejected, they're lonely, they're hurting. And, and I think we were there when the ladies were about to graduate. The joy on these ladies' lives and their faces is just remarkable. And I am so thrilled that we have the opportunity to partner with that ministry. Yeah, one thing that we didn't realize is that we were taking the women in and we knew that we were going to be helping them, but we didn't realize the impact we were going to have on their children because they come with their children. I actually have one such story of yeah. the Women's Center. Um, it's the photo with the mom and the baby. This is, Mir uh, not that one, Miriam and, um, and her daughter, Niamata. Niamata has microcephaly. Uh, first, her uh, husband came in with this child saying, what can you do to fix the child? And we tried to explain that the child had a medical condition, but the child still, you know, loved by God, was created by God, and that you can still care for this child. Um, and then the mother came in, and she was desperate. I think she was ready to just get rid of the child because she was being kicked out of her family if she decided to keep this child. Uh, in this country, a lot of people view any kind of, um, anything that's not normal as a curse. They think their family has been cursed, and so they didn't want that. They were they were going to make her throw this child away. Um, that's where you can see her on the left side, and then on the right side, what happened was we decided to um, invite her to come to the women's center. It wasn't even time for our program to start. It was in the summer, so we said, "Come and live here." Uh, we had our um, director for the women's center was there, and we had another woman that had just graduated that was still there, and so she came in and she was able to be ministered to by a former graduate who had given wow. her life to Christ. And so she gave her life to Christ. And you can see right now that picture on the right, where she is on the other picture, on the right, the difference between when she came in and she was scared to now how she loves her baby and she will not give up her baby and she'll do everything that she can so she can support her baby. Amen, amen. Well. <laughs> Why don't you tell us one other story about the other girl? Yeah, it's, really yeah. hard. it's really hard to pick certain stories, but I do have a special one, and that's Fatimata, and that's the other photo right here. Um, because of security, we have had to really beef up some of like guards that we have and different people that we have helping us out in that area. Um, and, of course, we our thoughts were we've got somebody that's there to kind of give us information and help us out to know if anything's going on. Um, but what we didn't realize was uh, how this was going to be a way for God to intervene in the life of this girl. Um, she had left her village. She and her two sisters uh, were being abused by their older brother. Their father had died. Their mother could not do anything about it. So all three girls fled in different directions. And Fatimata came to our town. Uh, she uh, was approached by a woman who said, hey, can you come? I'll give you work. Come live in my home and take care of my children. Um, she was noticing that the hours were really weird when the woman was gone, and it turns out that woman was prostitute. Um, and then we had heard word through our people who we hired for our security that the buzz was that within the next few days they were going to take her and ship her off, and she was going to be sex trafficked. 
So we were able to come in, get her into our orphanage. She had missed so much school that um, she just didn't know what she was gonna do with her life and she had no idea, but we gave her the opportunity to live with us and to go to sewing school so that she can learn a skill where she can care for herself. And you can see the look on her face. This is something she never thought was gonna be an opportunity for her. And she's super thrilled and excited. So just another way that you think something's gonna go one way and then God uses something in a different Amen. way. So church, I wanna encourage you with the thought. Sometimes you might sit back and think, okay, what do they do with all the offerings that they receive at HCC? I want you to know that it is your giving, your faithful giving that supports this ministry. And these changes that are taking place are not just a result of Amy and what Amy does, but it's a result of your faithfulness and our faithfulness together. So, so here's what I want to do. I want to have a special prayer for Amy and Moise, if we could do that. If I could have our elders and our missions team, if you're here and you're a part of our missions team or you're a part of our elders, would you come down? Amy, would you mind going down and we'll have a, a quick word of prayer? Let's pray for her. And, and obviously, I would encourage you as a church family, if Amy is not on your daily prayer list, I would encourage you to put her on your daily prayer list. Yes, yeah, so we could have our, our elders and their wives and our missions team, if you're part of our missions team, if you would come. And we just want to have a time of prayer, and we want to pray for her. She is one of us. And so um, I don't know whether you've ever met a modern-day hero, but she is a modern-day hero. And we rejoice. So, so she used to be sitting where you're sitting. They were just members of HCC. Now, they weren't just members because they were really involved in a lot of different things. But, but God reached down to our congregation and plucked them out and sent them to Africa. And he's using them in a great way. And we are so, so honored and thrilled that they're a part of our church. So as I pray, would you pray with me today? And, and let's surround Amy in prayer, asking for God's richest blessings on her. And by the way, please pray for her protection. Burkina Faso is not a safe place to live and to do ministry, especially for a foreigner. And so we really want to surround her with prayer and, and trust God to protect her. So let's pray together as a congregation. Can we do that? Father, thank you so much that you reach down and you call from out among us individuals, just as you did in the book of Acts when you reached down to the church of Antioch and you, Paul, you, you called Paul and Barnabas from that church. Thank you that you're still calling people today. And thank you that you called Mike and Amy. Or thank you that you used them and what we miss our brother Mike is Philip sang that song to live is Christ. And the die is gain. We couldn't help think of Mike who gave his life in service for you. And Father, we thank you for Amy. Thank you for her faithfulness. And Lord, we pray that your richest blessings would be upon her. Protect her. Put an army of angels around her. And Lord, protect her. Thank you for the way that you miraculously provide for the needs of her ministry. And thank you for the lives that are being changed and how we look forward to heaven when we're going to be able to meet all of these people and hear their stories and rejoice with them in the change that's taken place in their life, not only here, but, Lord, in the life to come. So we thank you for that. Thank you for the faithful giving of our congregation, Lord, who supports this ministry month after month and year after year. And Lord, I just pray that you'd continue to use us together for your honor and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's give her a hand once again. Thank you, Amy. So today we conclude our missions month, and we're going to conclude it. Thank you, Jonas. 
We're going to conclude it with a, a bang today because we're not only celebrating what God is doing in and through us in Burkina Faso, but we're celebrating what God is going to do through Operation Christmas Child and our partnership with Samaritan's Purse and our partnership with Operation Christmas Child. So today is our Operation Christmas Child Sunday. So if you're new to HCC and it's your first time here, these boxes aren't always here. We do this once a year. This is our eighth year, at least since I've been here, this is the eighth year to participate in Operation Christmas Child. And, and as a congregation, it's been our privilege to give thousands upon thousands of boxes. As a matter of fact, the last eight years, I think we've averaged somewhere around 1,000 boxes a year. Is that right, Kathy? And by the way, I, I want you to know, I think we're going to blow that number out of the water this year. I don't know what our exact number is, but I know we're going to do more than that. Last year, some 11 million boys and girls around the world received one of these boxes. These boxes contain, as you know, yeah, let's celebrate that. 11 million boys and girls. By the way, so you know too, so we not only do this as a church, but we are the regional distribution center for Operation Christmas Child. And I don't want to exaggerate, but, but Kathy, how many boxes come through here? It's tens of thousands, right? So, so tens of thousands of boxes come through here as we receive those and then we ship them out to uh, Americans Purse. And so each of these boxes contain special little gifts that you have purchased for either a boy or a girl in, uh, of a specific age. But more importantly, every single one of these boxes as they're shipped out will contain the copy or a copy of a little booklet called The Greatest Gift of All, which inside that box, inside that booklet, details a simple explanation of the gospel message. We've said before in Samaritan Purse, Samaritan's Purse reemphasizes it year after year, statistically, one out of every three children that receive one of these boxes give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we have no idea how many families are affected and the extended families that are affected as a result of just one simple little gift that is so very important. As I mentioned, these past year, eight years, we've given more than 1,000 boxes each year. And what a joy it is for us to give a simple thrill, a simple joy to boys and girls. But... We ask ourselves the question, is there any long-term impact to what we are doing? I mean, I mean, let's be honest. So, so the toys in these boxes will break at some point. If, it, if you purchase a piece of clothing for those children, at one point the clothing will wear out or they will outgrow it. And uh, I've even seen pictures of them playing with the box and at some point the box will disintegrate and the box will no longer be around. And some people might sit back and say, Brian, come on now, what, what effect are we really making? I was appalled yesterday. I was online and I was kind of uh, doing a little research and I saw one author had actually read written an article, not exaggerating, Donna, you might have seen it, this, the secular author had written an article, seven reasons not to participate in Operation Christmas Child. And I read that article and I was so angry when I read that article because I believe with all of my heart that we are making a difference. But how can one small box a bunch of small gifts truly make a difference? Those are great questions that are answered, I believe, in a few verses that I want us to read today. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to put the verses up on the screen. Matthew chapter 10, and I want to read just a few verses, and I want us to, to personalize this today. And we're going to end with a time of prayer and dedication for these boxes. But notice Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 40. Notice what Jesus says. Whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person 
will receive a righteous person's reward. Here's the verse I want you to catch. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Would you read that verse with me together? I love that verse. It's actually one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Let's read it together. Let's read it out loud. Ready? Here we go. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, surely I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Would you pray with me, Lord? Help us to understand what Jesus meant when he said what's contained in these verses. But even more importantly, Lord, I pray that you would challenge us today. I pray that you would motivate us. I pray that you would inspire us with the thought that little things that we do in Jesus' name truly make a difference. And God, we can change the world with the power of the gospel. Lord, not just through the big things that we do, but God, through your power, we can change the world even through the little things that we do. We give you all the praise and honor and glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's text is found at the end of an important discussion on discipleship. I'd encourage you to go back and read all of Matthew chapter 10 and see what Jesus says about discipleship. He's sending his 12 disciples out on a uh, ministry tour. But before he sends them out, he gives them detailed instructions as to what they will encounter while they're out representing him and in turn, how they should respond. He he makes several statements. Let me just make them real quick, and then we'll look at our verse. He says, a true disciple confesses the Lord. By the way, if you're sitting back today asking, am I a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Matthew chapter 10 outlines that. A true disciple confesses the Lord. He says that a true disciple forsakes his family Now, that doesn't mean today that you need to walk out on your wife or walk out on your kids. The idea is that you love Jesus more than anyone or more than anything. Can you say that today? Can can you actually say that you love Jesus Christ more than anyone or more than anything in your life? That's a requirement for discipleship. He says that a disciple offers his life, offers her life. And then he says that a disciple receives his or her reward. And and I want you to catch that. That's so very important because what you and I do in Jesus' name does not go unnoticed. Sometimes we do insignificant things. We demonstrate kindness. We reach out to people and no one knows what we do. Take heart today. God knows what you and I do and God registers it. A believer's service for God does not go unnoticed. God will reward kind words and good deeds no matter how insignificant they may seem. And that truth is clearly seen, especially in verse 42. So notice a couple of things. I gave you just a couple of words in your outline that I kind of want to drive home in our hearts today. So notice, first of all, there is an effort There is an effort that is made on the part of a disciple to do something for someone else for God. Jesus says, whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water. I love, and and let's just dissect that for a second, because the term little ones doesn't necessarily speak of children. It could I don't think Jesus was was intentionally just speaking of little ones. He could have, but the terms little ones speaks of individuals who seem insignificant, individuals who seem unimportant. Remember the story? You guys remember the story? Remember the story when Jesus was teaching and little children came around him and the disciples started shooing them off? Go on, get out of here. You guys aren't important. Come on. Jesus is teaching the adults something. Get out of here. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes the disciples, and he says, no, no, no. Let these little ones come to me. Why is that? He says, because of such are the kingdom of God. 
In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. Those who seem insignificant to us, those who seem unimportant to us, are important to God. You say, Brian, who could that be? Well, it may be a new believer who is struggling with his or her Christian life. It may be a homeless individual that you pass on the street that hasn't had a warm meal for a couple of days. It may be a sorrowing neighbor who just lost someone very close to them. It may be a coworker, a discouraged coworker who was just laid off and lost their job. It may be a poor child that is alone and forgotten. They are the little ones, the ones whom the world has apparently forgotten. I love to go back to what Amy said. I love that street boys ministry that she has. And I'm not sure whether that's the correct terminology, Amy, but these are, the, these are little boys that have been basically abandoned by their families that are out on their own begging and trying to get by. And I love the fact that Amy had a heart for them and sat back and said, we have to do something to minister to them. Why is that? Because those little guys are important to Jesus. They are little ones. Jesus says this. He said, if you give these little ones a cup of water, the phrase a cup of water speaks of a small, seemingly trivial action, an act that many would consider ordinary and you might even consider commonplace, something that is very easy to perform, something that everyone could do, but quite frankly, many people don't do. The idea being that because one is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, he or she, you or I, go out of our way and we make a special effort to attend the simple needs of others. <laughs> Let me just pause for a second. Can you think of anybody in your life who needs that kind of attention? Maybe it's somebody that you pass day after day as you're headed to work and they're out on the street and they need something and you pass them day after day and most people are kind of blind to them. But as a believer, you, you see them and your heart goes out to them. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, you feel like you need to do something and you demonstrate effort. There's a second word that I would use, not only the effort, but the extra it's interesting to note that Jesus made mention of the fact that the water was cold. Did you catch that in the passage? He, he said to give a cup of cold water. Now, for us, let's be honest, for us, a cup of cold water is, might not be that big a deal because we turn on the faucet at the house and out probably comes a little bit of cooler water. Or if the water is not real cool, it's during the summer and the water's a little bit hotter. At our house, all we got to do is turn around and there's the refrigerator and we can get ice or we can pull water out of the refrigerator or we have a freezer. To us, cold water really is no big deal because we have access to cold water all the time. But I would remind you that when Jesus wrote this, refrigerators did not exist. Freezers did not exist. To give someone not just a cup of water was an effort, but to give them a cup of cold water was extra. Somebody would have to go out of their way just a little bit. They would have to know what to do to make the water cold. Man, I... How much of a blessing is it when we are able to not only demonstrate effort, but when we're able to go just a little bit extra, when we're able to do just a little bit more, when we're able to go out of our way just a little bit more to minister to the needs of others. I heard the story of a missionary in the South Pacific that was serving on a remote island. 
And after a year of serving on the remote island, the, the people of the island, the natives of the island wanted to recognize the missionary, and so they brought different gifts for the missionary. And this one gentleman brought simply a bouquet of flowers and gave it to the missionary. But the missionary immediately recognized the flowers because those flowers were only found one place in the world on the backside of the island that was very difficult to get to. It was difficult to traverse. It would take a long time to get there. And so the missionary, he received the flowers, the vase of unusual flowers, and he, he asked the individual, why did you go to so much trouble to get me those flowers? You must have walked miles and miles for them. And the native looked at the missionary and simply responded, the walk was part of the gift. <laughs> I love that. Because sometimes it's not the monetary expense of what we do. It's the extra that, that goes into it. Jesus says, man, when you a follower of Jesus Christ, give a cup of cold water. Even in his poverty, he found a way to give extra. Let me ask you, have you ever had anybody shower something extra on you? Somebody that you knew that they made a sacrifice to give you what they gave you. It means something special. I think most of you know Vicky and I were missionaries in Mexico for 10 years. And at one point I was preaching down in Chiapas, which is the southern part of Mexico, in, in, uh, in, in the small town, Tuxla Gutierrez, Chiapas. And I was preaching up in the mountains in the small church. And the pastor was kind and he was trying to protect me because he knew I had a gringo stomach. And so he said, Brian, I'm going to take care of all of your meals. Don't worry about it. And one day he comes to me and he says, Brian, there's this family in the church that really wants you to come to supper. Would you go to their house for supper? I'm like, okay, I'll go to their house for supper. And so the lady comes to me before the service and she says, Brian, te gusta sopa de camarones? Do you, do you like shrimp soup? I'm like, look at me. I like anything, all right? <laughs> of course I like shrimp soup. And so they invite me to their house. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I walked in this house, one of the most humble homes I've ever been in, dirt floor. Much of the house had no ceiling whatsoever. And these people were so honored to have this American missionary come and eat in their home. And so she sits me down at this table, and, and I was the guest of honor, and so she brings me out this bowl of sopa de camarones and sits it right in front of me. I, I, only God knows the sacrifice that they made to serve that to me, and then she steps back to watch me eat it. <laughs> and I look down, and I see not shrimp like you and I are used to, you know, that you know it's already been husked or shredded or whatever they do to shrimp, but I'm looking down at whole shrimp in this bowl. You know, the head and all the little uh, antennas that come out. And I don't want to offend this lady. They made an unbelievable sacrifice for me, and so I just look at her and thank you, and I look at the soup, and I thank him about three or four times, and I'm wondering, Lord, how am I going to eat this? And so she said, after a minute or so, she said, she excused herself, and I looked over to the pastor, and I said, como se come? How do I eat this? He said, oh, Brian, you just dig your hands in, you pop off the head, you pop off the tail, and you put the meat in your mouth. I thought, praise the Lord, I can do that. I can do that. These people went extra for me. That's what Jesus is saying about giving a cup of cold water. As a disciple, we not only make the effort, but we do the extra. Notice, notice quickly, we see the inspiration. What was the motivation for service? We see in the text that this cup of cold water, it says in our text that it was given in the name of a disciple. Mark chapter 41, a parallel passage, Jesus says it this way, whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink, notice what he says, in my name. In other words, our motivation, our inspiration is what? It's not something we do for our own honor. It's not something we do for our own glory. But we do for what we do in the name of whom? In the name 
of Jesus. I love how that ties in with these boxes because I can pick up any one of these boxes and this box right here is destined for a girl 10, 10 years old to 14 years old. And so only the Lord knows where this box is going. In the next couple of months, this box is going somewhere around the world, and a 10- to 14-year-old girl is going to receive this box. And when she opens it up, I have no idea whose box this is. But when this little girl opens up this box, your name's not going to be on it. It's not going to be like, oh, this came from Brian and Vicki Burkholder. How cool is that? This, the, this box is given in whose name? In Jesus' name. We give these boxes to boys and girls around the world in the name of Jesus. So what inspires us to do all of this? I gotta be honest, church, I'm, I'm moved by this. I recognize how much each of these boxes cost, and I am moved by the generosity of you as a congregation. I am moved by your desire to be used by God to impact the life of a child. Who inspires us to do this? It's Jesus. Whoever gives a box, whoever gives a cup of cold water, in Jesus' name, we do what we do as followers of Christ. We don't emphasize it enough, but as followers of Christ, we are called Christians, little Christs, we do what we do as representatives of Jesus Christ. The encouragement is the fourth thing. Jesus, I say to you, or Jesus says, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. The NLT says you will surely be rewarded. The Holman translation says he will never lose his reward child of God who is involved in all of these small services, you and I can rest assured that God has recorded every deed done in his name. He knows what we do, and he knows why we do it. He knows the motivation of our hearts. What what an encouragement to know that God will record our works, no matter how insignificant they may seem. Let me give you a couple of applications. And we'll pull all of this to a close this morning. Here's a couple of applications. The first is this. You have it in your outline. Doing the small things shows the main thing of God's love at work. Let me say that again. Doing the small things shows the main thing of God's love at work. If we're not careful, it's easy for us to think that God only blesses the big sacrifices God only recognizes the large gifts. God only sees the big acts of kindness. But that simply is not true. Each work done for the Lord, whether small or large, will not go unnoticed. Remember remember the story when Jesus was there in the temple with the disciples? I love this story, by the way. And it says that they sat right by, or they stood by the offering box. And this is probably my translation, but it says, and they watched how people gave. (laughs) I sit back and thought, oh my word, what would happen if if God was watching us give? (laughs) So he watched how people gave, and evidently there were people who were bringing large amounts of money in, and the disciples were, were blown away by what some people were giving. And here's an older lady that comes in with just a small coin and drops it in the box. And Jesus takes notice. And he looks at his disciples and he said, oh, did you see what she just gave? Yeah, Jesus, it was just a little coin. I mean, it it was just change. She dropped it in the box. It It was insignificant. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. She gave more than anyone else. They gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. You see, here's the thing, church, doing the small things, and I'm not discouraging you from giving large gifts, but doing the small things shows the main thing 
of God's work. Every handshake, every hug or embrace will be remembered. Every meal cooked for a sick person, every kind word for a discouraged person, every laborious deed done for a single mom, all of that will be recorded. All of those are demonstrations of God's love. I love how John said it. John said it this way in 1 John 3, 17 and 18. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother, sees someone else in need, and shuts up his heart, how does God's love dwell, abide in him? And then he says, my little children, let's just not love in word of tongue, but let's love in deed, let's love in truth. It's the little things that show the main thing of God's love. Here's the second thing. Understand that simple acts done with great love will change the world. What's going to change the world in which we live? It's simple acts of Christ-like love. So, so let me ask you, and I don't want to anger anybody, but is anybody else sick and tired of political commercials yet? All right, almost makes me not want to watch television. All right, all right, so many of them. Listen, only Jesus can change the world in which we live. Hey, hey, don't get me wrong. I want you to vote. I think you should vote. You should vote your conscience. You should vote your Christian principles. But let's be reminded that what will change the world is Jesus Christ. And it's the representatives of Jesus Christ who do his work with an act of love who can change the world in which we live. So I want to challenge you today as we leave here. Let's go out and change the world. And let's change the world by just simple acts of love as followers of Jesus Christ. There's a third thing, and I'm done. Realize that my service, realize that your service is not based upon who we are, but it is Jesus who works through us. Anything that God allows us to do, and I, I, I say this because it's so easy for us to take credit for what we're doing, is it not? Oh my word, I gave 10 boxes this year, or I did this, or I donated this, or, or I gave so many hours here. Realize that it is not us. It is God. It is Jesus who manifests himself through us. That is so extremely important. My service, your service, is not based upon who we are. We are nothing without Jesus. But Jesus comes alongside of us, and he empowers us, and he enables us, and he gifts us, and he gives us resources, and he gives us the ability to make a difference in his name. So you and I are nothing more than channels, instruments that God wants to use to make a difference in this world. So I encourage you with this thought, and I'm done. God wants to use you. No matter who you are here today, no matter how long you've been a believer today, it doesn't matter what your resources are. It doesn't matter how gifted you are today. It doesn't matter how eloquent you are today. God wants to use you. How encouraging is it to know that through these small demonstrations of love, God desires to impact hundreds and thousands of lives and hundreds and thousands of lives of boys and girls. Jesus says this, a cup of cold water can change a life and bring glory to God. I'm so thrilled that we as a church can have a part in this.